All right, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so this uh, talk is uh, maybe a little bit different than many of the others in the workshop. Uh, first, instead of talking about where we stand with speculative new assumptions and what kind of crazy amazing crypto we can do with such assumptions, I'll be talking about going back to the most uh, basic assumptions in crypto, like one functions. Um, and uh, secondly, this is uh, more tutorial. I was asked by the organizers with some prompting, I think, from Hugo and Tal uh, to give more of a tutorial. So this is not really um, you know, talking about new results. I mean, uh, nothing here is, is uh, more recent than, than five years old. Um, but because it's kind of meant to be tutorial-like, I really want to understand. It's not important that I get through everything, so more than even usual, please stop me if anything is unclear or if you'd like me to go into more detail uh, on something. Um, and anyway, so, you know, why go back to some of these classic, classic things? Uh, so first, uh, hopefully I'll be able to convey that there are still some really intriguing and basic open questions there that uh, would be nice to get more people thinking about. And second, uh, I also hope that some of the notions that have come out in, in these efforts uh, can also be useful in some of the more cryptomania things that people are, are doing these days. Um, all right, so let's get started. Right, so the classic result we're, uh, we'll be focusing on primarily is uh, uh, the, the Hill result from any one-way function. Uh, we can construct a pseudo-random generator, one of the uh, most fundamental results in the foundations of uh, cryptography. Um, and uh, as you probably all know, and, and despite this being an amazing result and showing that you can build pseudo-random generators, and hence lots of other interesting crypto from the kind of this very minimal assumption of uh, one-way functions, uh, there are some things that are not entirely. Is this blocking? Is the board blocking the bottom of the slides for people in the front? No. Okay. Uh, there are some things that were uh, considered somewhat unsatisfactory in the in the Hill result. Uh, so first, in terms of efficiency, if you start with a one-way function on n bits. Uh, the original paper of Hill gives a pseudorandom generator with a seed length of something like n to the 10th. Uh, and uh, where uh, also in terms of time efficiency, the generator makes roughly n to the 9th queries of the only function. Uh, both of these bounds were improved um, uh, in um, work of Hollenstein uh, about uh, 10 years ago, more than a, a decade ago. Um, by a factor of n squared, um, but still very far from anything that we might consider even you know, approaching uh, practical. But perhaps more importantly, uh, you know, that when you see a construction with this kind of complexity, as you would Im imagine, the, the complexity is also one in terms of conceptual complexity. Uh, we would like to have a, a simpler construction uh, that we can kind of really uh, understand better. Um, and Hollenstein did give some very important simplifications uh, to the Hill result, particularly for, for, the, for the uniform setting, but still is more complex than we can. So one thing I want to point out here, because it'll come up later in the talk, notice in, in both results, the original Hill and Hollenstein, the seed length is a factor of n larger than the number of queries to the one-way function. And that is because the, the dominant use of the seed is to specify q independent inputs to the one-way function. And so each of those costs, costs in bits. Um, there's also some of the seed is used, used for hash functions or seeds to a randomness extractor, but the dominant contribution are these ev evaluation points for the one-way functions. All right, so the more recent works uh, that I'll be uh, talking about from kind of five plus uh, years ago um, are these works with uh, Heitner and Brian Gold and, and then my student Colin Chen, where we improved the seed length uh, to n to the fourth and then down to n cubed uh, and the number of queries to the one-way function uh, to n, n cubed. Okay, already here maybe we can just come back to that, that point. In the first construction, 
we have Q independent evaluations to the one-way function. Uh, and in the second result, the savings on seed length is not coming at a savings to the number of queries, so somehow we're making the evaluations in a dependent way, which, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, but ag again, more importantly, perhaps than the complexity parameters, though, you know, those are certainly um, things we care about, and I will talk about open, they're still open problems, big open problems related to these. Um, what I want to emphasize most in the tutorial are the, um, uh, are the notions that enabled getting these uh, savings and kind of how we reason about those notions. Specifically, there are going to be notions of computational entropy. Okay, so uh, what's the plan? Um, kind of talk a little bit in, uh, in general, re refresh our memory on uh, cryptography, the state of cryptography based on one-way functions. Uh, and then uh, that will lead us into reviewing notion, information, both information theoretic notions of entropy as well as computational analogs of entropy. Different, uh, there will be lots of varieties of pseudo-entropy that come up in the talk. We will see how these notions can kind of give us a different perspective on the uh, uh, also classic even more classic and simpler result of uh, constructing pseudorandom generators from one-way permutations. And that will kind of uh, lead us naturally into kind of thinking about why the same ideas don't apply or don't give something as useful in the case of one-way functions, leading us to what, what new notions of, of entropy we need to use in the, in the context of one-way functions, uh, of pseudo-entropy. And then we'll lead to open problems. And then if there's time, uh, at the end, I might say a little bit about a dual notion of computational entropy called inaccessible entropy and kind of compare it to what's, what's going on here. But it's okay if we don't get to that. Uh, so yes? There are also sort of some kind of lower norms for number of queries. Yes, I will talk about this. Polish uh, and Sina. Yeah, I will, I will talk about this. Uh, good. All right, so we all know what a one way function is. Um, I don't. Uh, we need for this group to review the definition, but just want to stress, um, you know, an adversary succeeds in inverting a one-way function if it finds any pre-image of the uh, one-way function, um, and that's the source of, you know, since the function may not be one-to-one, -one, that's going to be the source of, you know, many of the difficulties in handling general one-way function. And the second thing I want to point out is that uh, for simplicity in the tutorial, we will just work in the traditional regime of polynomial security. Um, you know, everything, of course, as usual, can be made quantitative, and you can look in the original papers to, to see the quantitative um, bounds and dependence on security and so on. Okay, so, um, I, you know, again, this is, you know, uh, I mean, we, we like to, and even in Pagliazzo, uh, you know, refer to cryptography from one-way functions as mini-crypt, but it's still, I don't know, to me, at least still pretty amazing to think how much cryptography we can do <coughs> assuming only uh, the existence of one-way functions, which I think of as a very raw form of computational hardness, right? All it's saying is that I, I can sample uh, a hard distribution on, on NP problems together, together with a solution, uh, a witness, uh, such that, you know, given the instance, it's, it's hard to, to, to find the witness. Very um, natural and, and raw form of computational hardness, and yet we can do tons of um, interesting uh, crypto. Uh, all right, and so the kind of question here is really, so you know, all of these kind of crypto we do from one-way functions usually goes through starting with the one-way function and then in one step building something that is a more structured form of, uh, of, of hardness, a, a, a more structured kind of cryptographic primitive, which is interesting in its own right, so pseudorandom generators, woofs, or statistically hiding commitments are, are three such examples, and then once you have these, it's kind of much more, we're more in this, the realm of standard, you know, construction of cryptographic protocols um, and manipulations of these things. And so the question, kind of philosophical question, is what, is to try to understand what is it 
um, that enables us to turn the raw hardness of one-way functions into these structured building blocks for cryptography. And the answer that seems to be um, becoming <coughs> more and more uh, clear is uh, that the answer lies in, in, in understanding computational entropy, and specifically, you know, every cryptographic primitive we can, maybe not every, but many cryptographic primitives we can think of as in, 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 the, in, as in a language of some kind of form of computational entropy. And secondly, and this is where one-way functions come in, uh, if we look closely enough and in the right way, we can find immediately in any one-way function at least a little bit of this kind of computational entropy. All right, and so then the work is taking this little bit of computational entropy that's there in the one-way function and finding a way to amplify and man manipulate it, massage it into uh, a more qualitative and, and, and structured um, form. And this certainly is the case in, the, in constructing pseudo-random generators from one-way functions. Okay, so now that with that motivation, we lead into a review of notions of entropy. Um, so maybe, you know, unlike many uh, crypto talks, they will Shannon entropy will be playing an important role. Right? So the the map think of log of probability mass as measuring the, the randomness in, in a in a specific sample, and Shannon entropy is taking the average of that quantity. Um, and also, conditional entropies will play also a very important role in the talk. So, conditional entropy of x given z for jointly distributed random variables is the average over z, or samples from z, of the entropy of x conditioned on z. Okay. But, um, you know, more standard for crypto, we will also um, uh, use. Uh, and discuss notions of, uh, of min entropy, right? So min, we replace the expectation, min entropy replaces the expectation with a minimum, um, though sometimes it's convenient instead to think of it as taking the log of the max, of the reciprocal of the maximum probability map. So it's more of a worst case notion. Instead of average, we're taking the, the worst case, the least amount of entropy contributed uh, by any sample. And then this uh, very nice notion of average min entropy introduced by uh, Dodis, Ostrowski, Raisin, and Smith, which is a that you should all want to keep. Am I writing too small? Good. Word's not very big, so I don't want to. Use up too much real estate too quickly. All right, where we do take an expectation over Z when we're conditioning on Z. All right, so there's not one universally agreed upon definition of conditional min entropy. Um, there, there are many ways that one might, a number of different ways one might think of, of defining it, but this one is quite useful and, and, and appealing, and we'll, we'll see why. So here you do take an average over z, but very importantly we take the average not outside the logarithm, but in the denominator here inside the logarithm. Right? So we take the expectation over z of the maximum probability mass of x conditioned on z. And one reason that is so nice is that it has this <coughs> operational interpretation as the maximum guessing probability. So we can think of it as this uh, guessing entropy of taking the maximum over all unbounded algorithms A of the probability that uh, take, take the, you know, the best overall algorithms of your probability of predicting guessing x from z. Okay? And take the log of the reciprocal of that as your measure of entropy. Okay? So this is a, um, I mean, this interpretation is, is, is probably why 
this has turned out to be such a useful notion of conditional min entropy, and particularly in cryptographic uh, settings where where such a such a quantity might might come up naturally. All right. So if, if this is at most two to the minus k, I mean, if, if this is if, if this is at least k, that means I can guess x from z with probability at most two to the minus k. Okay. So. Um, a second thing, so it has this nice interpretation. A second thing is that it uh, supports uh, randomness extraction. So if the en this min entropy of x given z is at least k, I can extract nearly k bits of almost uniform bits from x, even conditioned on z. So I'm going to write that as a definition. Extractor for all x z with entropy of x given z is at least k. Um, we have x with a random c. All right, so an extractor takes two inputs, right? It takes its source and the, the seed length. And a seed, a uniform and independent seed of, uh, of some length. And this should be epsilon plus uniform and statistical distance. And it's the output length of the extractor here. Um, even given the seed, so this is what's sometimes called a strong extractor, and the side, this conditioning information. So this is, this is sometimes referred to as average case extractor. The usual definition of K epsilon extractor that, that you'll find doesn't have a Z. It just talks about a random variable with some at least min entropy K on its own. Um, but it turns out that every extractor is also one of the, K, in the usual sense, K epsilon extractor is also one of these, uh, also extraction this conditional min entropy. Um, maybe with a factor of two loss in epsilon or something like that. Okay. So we have such extractors, and uh, um, so there exist such extractors with uh, an output length, which is the min entropy minus twice two log one over epsilon. How close do you want to be uniform? Constant and uh, get rid of it, and the seed length, right? Give the name, the seed length uh, being polynomial and log of n over epsilon, all right? And this is, I mean, an efficient, so poly time extract. Um, I mean, this is actually a, so what's known, so this can be a big O um, at the price of paying a constant factor here. But I think in cryptographic settings, usually we, we care more about getting almost all of the entropy out um, and care less about optimizing the, the seed length. So yeah, do stop me if there's any questions. OK, so now that was information theoretic notion of entropy. Uh, let's uh, now talk about uh, computational notions. And I see I'm going to run out of word space quickly. Um, all right, so the Original and kind of most, maybe most useful notion of pseudo-entropy was that introduced by, uh, in the original Hill paper, um, which says that uh, a random variable has pseudo-entropy at least k if it's computationally indistinguishable from some other random variable whose actual entropy is at least k. And this notion for 
uh, is, is generally interesting uh, when K, when <clears throat> the reason I define it is um, as pseudo-entropy at least K is that what this definition is interesting when the pseudo-entropy is larger than the actual entropy of the random variable X. Okay, so, um, uh, and in fact, we know if you, you know, believe that pseudo-random generators exist, there do exist random variables whose, whose pseudo-entropy is much larger than their real entropy. The output of a pseudo-random generator has maximal pseudo-entropy. It's indistinguishable from the uniform distribution. Um, uh, and its real entropy is bounded by its seed length, which can be much shorter. Right? So already here, we see that this you know, cryptographically useful object, the pseudo-random generator, can be understood as an extreme form of this notion of computational entropy. Right? This is a quantitative generalization of pseudo-randomness. And it makes sense that this would be useful as an intermediate step, just trying to get some gap between pseudo-entropy and entropy. It's useful as an intermediate step towards getting uh, full-fledged pseudo-randomness. Okay. So, um, so good. So I made this remark, right? You might try to define also upper bounds on entropy in a similar way, saying something has small pseudo-entropy at most k, it's indistinguishable from uh, some random variable of small entropy. And that turns out not to be a uh, very useful way of upper bounding computational entropy. Um, it turns out every random variable is indistinguishable from something with very low entropy. So these are useful as lower bounds on computational entropy. Okay, and then uh, one has, uh, has variants of this, like uh, conditional versions. So we have jointly distributed random variables, x and z. x is pseudo-entropy at least k given z. If there's a random variable y correlated with z, jointly distributed with z, that such that y together with z is computationally distinguishable from x together with z, and the entropy of y given z is at least k. Uh, so, one thing to note here is we, in this definition, when we consider the variable that we're comparing x to, uh, y, we, we, y has to be together with the same, we don't allow to change the distribution of z here. And okay? this is, um, this is a choice. It also makes sense as a definition and is sometimes useful to consider the, the, a different definition where we say there exists a, 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 a pair of jointly distributed random variables y and z prime such that y z prime is computationally indistinguishable from xz. And the entropy of y given z prime is at least k. Um, but this is the one we'll work with in this tutorial and comes up in the constructions that we'll be talking about. Is there a significant difference? Like is one of them better than the other for some application? Why would it matter? Uh, let's see. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head a good quick answer. Certainly in the application here of these constructions, this is the thing that comes up naturally and hence we work with it. Um, I, ha I don't recall whether one could plug in the other <laughs> definition and still get, get things to work out as uh, smoothly. Maybe Evgeny knows, are there places where the difference between the two definitions? I mean, I remember that if one of them has chain rule, the other doesn't. Right, right. right. So there are properties that hold for... The complications. Yeah, there are properties that hold for one but not the other. It's maybe like composition, so if you can kind of roll back to the beginning of time, you can change everything, but I guess, I don't know, I guess in your application, you cannot roll back to the beginning of time, you have to do it like incrementally. Yeah, so may maybe it can be, in, even in the application we'll see here, we, we, we need this, this definition exactly for those sorts of reasons. So this is more composable. This is more composable, that's right. But sometimes the other one suffices for applications, and sometimes you can achieve the other one when you can't achieve this one. Thanks. Um, all right, and then of course you can also do, these are uh, so far, so just again to remember, when we have an H in this talk, it's Shannon entropy. All right? When I want to talk about min entropy, there'll always be the talk script of uh, this H infinity. Okay? So one can also talk about min entropy, both unconditional and conditional uh, uh, pseudo min entropy. Okay, so uh, let's 
pseudo-entropy, Hill pseudo-entropy. Y x z computation is indistinguishable from y z and entropy of y given z is at least k or min entropy or unconditional by right, all, all these uh, variants. All right, so one reason why is Hill pseudo entropy? I say it's the most useful of the computational entropies. The reason is that. Um, uh, well, the reason is that computational indistinguishability is, is, uh, tells you, and two, two things that are computationally indistinguishable, working with one is just as good as working with the other uh, for all efficient uh, purposes. And in particular, when it comes to randomness extraction, it tells you that working, uh, you know, trying to uh, extract from X given Z is indistinguishable from extracting from Y given Z. Okay, and so if y has min entropy at least k given z, and we hence can extract from y, we can also extract pseudo-random bits from x, something that's computationally indistinguishable from uniforms. Okay, so if we achieve large Hill pseudo-entropy, then just by applying any efficiently computable randomness extractor, we get pseudo-randomness right away. All right, so now uh, that's it for notions of pseudo-entropy. So now let's revisit the construction of pseudo-random generators from one-way permutations. I'm not going to do all details. I'm assuming it's familiar to most people, uh, but just in this language of, uh, of pseudo-entropy. All right, so, um, and one thing to, to point out here um, is that when we construct a pseudo-random generator from a one-way permutation, not only is the construction simpler, but it's you know, as efficient as you could hope for. So uh, you can get a seed length that is linear in the input length of the, of the one-way function that you started with, and in fact can be even one plus little o of one times the length, input length of the one-way one -way function. And a pseudo-random generator, so here throughout the talk we're only caring about getting some stretch, stretch of at least one bit. Um, you only, to do that, you only need to make one query to the one-way function one way permutation. Things that we would love to be able to achieve from uh, general one way functions. Uh, all right, so here's a kind of modern interpretation of this uh, uh, classic result. So in the language of pseudo entropy. So uh, what I want to say is, so we had guessing entropy as a notion. Maybe that's yes. a sort of meta question. Is it is it like does it make sense to consider the difference between length like n and n squared and n cubed if we're not talking about exact security? Because you know if you don't talk about the security of the reduction because you know there's no real difference to <coughs> take the security parameter to be square root of n. Yeah. So so to really for that for that <coughs> distinction to be well, it, it it's important in, when you think of the. Uh, all right, so if you think of your functions as, you know, kind of, yeah, infinite families, then it doesn't make sense. You could just change your security parameter. You're right. Um, so one way, of one way of making sense of it is, you know, you talk about uh, just about anything in this, in this finite length setting where you know, I'm given one function and I need to construct the pseudo-random generator, I don't have the freedom to change my security parameter. That's one way of making sense of this. And uh, a, second, um, a second way is to be more, use concrete security, which again it is and has been done for all of these constructions in the, in the papers that actually talk about quantitatively how the security of the pseudorandom generator relates to that of the one-way function. And Typically it's like polynomially related. But uh -huh. well, like Goldrack Levin I thought was not that tight, like you don't get, if you want to do to that security you probably won't be able to Uh, but it does will preserve two to the constant times n, oh, okay. which is enough to make a dip. I mean, that makes a difference between uh, uh, n and n squared <laughs> two to the constant. So you do lose yeah. that constant in the exponent, which for practice uh, may be more than you want to pay. 
But if you use a construction that blows up, like Yao's original construction blows up the seed length, I don't know, to n squared or something, mm -hmm. your resulting pseudorandom genera generator will have security like two to the square root of s, um, whereas Goldberg lives in gives you two to the constant times s. Thanks. Any other questions on that point? Okay, so um, good. All right, so the getting to just, just sorry, I mean, if it's too long, we can. But, but so if there is no permutation, it's like P epsilon secure, right? One the permutation. So for, and let's say P is polynomial and epsilon is like, you know, 2 to the minus n or something like that. Uh, but P is only polynomial. For the PRG, you can only get like very negligible security, right? You cannot like get, like if you want to, like if one interpretation is poly n, 2 to the minus, you know, whatever, n essentially secure. Oh. Whatever is not contradicting time space traders, but let's say. And right. you're saying the, the, indis the distinguishability. So I haven't right. thought of Because you know, if you get epsilon prime, you, the reduction will be t divided by epsilon prime squared. So in order for this to be polynomial, epsilon will be like just barely negligible. Yeah, so when, when, you, make things, when yeah. you make things concrete, there's another choice is do you, do, you insi do you insist on running time of the adversary and success probability being yeah. linked to each other? Yeah. Or not, and oh. you're suggesting that when they're not linked to each other, right. then there's uh, yeah, there is a there's a bigger efficiency right. issue in in uh, in right. Goldrick in the construction here that also is an open open problem. Yeah, thanks. All right, good. So let's try to understand this in terms of computational entropy. And so one notion of computational entropy that immediately kind of just jumps out at you from the definition of one-wayness is, is a computational analog of this guessing entropy, which was a, you know equivalent formulation of conditional min entropy. So um, what does one-wayness one uh, tell you? It tells you that the probability of predicting x from f of x is negligible, okay? And that, you know, for a case of a one-to-one -one function or a one-way permutation, that, that really is equivalent to uh, a two-to-one-wayness. And so that's, we can think of that as, as a notion of pseudo-entropy, where we just restrict this maximum over all A to, um, uh, to polynomial time, or computationally bounded A, algorithms A. Uh, so, here we say this is guessing entropy is at least k means that for all poly time a probability of a of z equals x is at most two to the minus k. Okay, so that's that's great, but. Um, general as useful a notion as Hill pseudo -entropy. So here we are not saying that x combined with x together, so uh, x is indistinguishable from something of high pseudo entropy given f of x. We're just saying that, you know, this property holds that you can predict x from f of x. And in fact, uh, if we take z to be f of x here, the Hill pseudo entropy is negligible of, of x given z. All right, so x given f of x, and the reason is that you can efficiently check, a distinguisher can efficiently check whether the second component is f of the first component, right, by the easiness condition of a one-way function, right? Which means um, I can distinguish x f of x from any distribution where that's not in the support, you know, where the second component is different from the first uh, with non-negligible probability. Um, but if, if, if the second component is f of the first, the first is determined by the second as zero entropy. All right, so there can be a very big gap between guessing pseudo-entropy and ordinary pseudo -entropy. Uh, so how do we get to pseudo-randomness? Well, uh, it turns out that nevertheless, guessing pseudo-entropy also supports randomness extraction. But you need a special kind of extractor with a, sometimes
sometimes there's many names for, for these kinds of extractors. One name that's been given in the literature is a reconstructive extractor. Um, and what a reconstructive extractor does is gives you to get comes with an efficient reduction from distinguishing the output of the extractor from uniform to predicting the value of the source x from which you're extracting. Okay, so it's uh, it's an extractor that's just not not just efficient to compute, but comes with this efficient reduction from you know from the property it's supposed to achieve with its output to the property of, you know violating the property that uh, uh, is supposed to be guaranteed on the end. Um, and a modern interpretation of one of the many modern interpretations of the goldrush levin theorem is saying that the kind of inner product mod 2 extractor is a reconstructive extractor. Um, so I was not planning, originally I was thinking I would go into some details on, on defining formally what is a reconstructive extractor and how goldreich levin can be seen as a reconstructive extractor, but I think kind of after putting everything together for sake of time, uh, we won't be using the notion of reconstructive extractor again when we talk about two random generation moment functions. I think I just will stop here um, on that. Can you just say it's an informal Informally, a reconstructive extractor comes with an efficient reduction that says if you violate what the, the property that the, that the output has, meaning I have a test that distinguishes the output of the extractor from uniform, then efficiently, given Oracle access to this test, I can predict x uh, with probability bigger than two to the minus k. So it's like you're defining it to be useful for this uh, guessing. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, the way I like to define reconstructive extractor is is a little bit different. That implies the property that I've said that where it's not that I guess with probability bigger than two to the minus k, but I. I guess with high probability, I'm able to I'm able to compute it uh, with certainty given k bits of advice, and then if I choose the advice at random, I violate this property. But that definition has come up actually for other reasons in the study of extractors that were not that were not this. So is yes, this, is this related to the list decoding interpretation. Yes, yes, it is. So that's why I like that interpretation because I think of this advice as indexing into the the possible list decodings. Of your of your distinguisher. That's the, and that's how this this interpret this formulation of extractors has come up independently in the in the literature. So many but not all constructions of extractors are known to have this reconstructive property. Um, you can you can design artificial ones using crypto that that aren't reconstructive. All right, any other questions? But not every university has functions. You said using crypto, but it's just in this level of generality, universal cash functions are not required. Are not known to be reconstructive. Oh, Maybe it's not just count, count the number, uh, oh, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, yeah, but I guess if you take any any code with distance close to a half right. that's not locally decodable, right. it won't be. It probably won't be reconstructive. Oh, it's which and it's probably not hard to come up with. Uh, I mean, I guess LDPC codes, okay. random LD, LDPC codes are not locally, those are not locally tested. Okay. One, sh one should be able to come up with a, an example okay. along those lines. Maybe something with large tool distance. Like. So is it, is it, is it like a one-to-one -one correspondence between a reconstructive extractor and a list decoding? Uh, if the output length is short. So when, when M is one bit, like in Goldreich Levin, in the basic Goldreich Levin, then it's really equivalent to a uh, locally list decodable code. Uh, but when the output get length gets larger, the notions start to diverge from each other. There's some blow up of like 2 to the n uh, that occurs. All right, great. All right, so, um, all right, so we talked about just now how guessing entropy can be very different from pseudo-entropy. Like for example, when we talk about the entropy of x given f of x for a one-way permutation. Uh, but it turns out that in some 
parameter regime, in particular when the random variable x is short, they actually are equivalent to each other. Okay, so if I have a jointly distributed pair of random variables, x and z, z is not necessarily short, z can be n bits long, where n is our security parameter, but x is uh, at most logarithmic length, then the guessing entropy of x given, pseudo entropy of x given z is equal to the Hill pseudo min entropy of x given z. Right, so if I can't predict x with probability better than 2 to the minus k, then x is actually indistinguishable from some random variable of min entropy at least k given z. When x is 1, so you can see there's a long kind of list of references. So the first one here is in Pagliazzo. So it turns out when x is one bit long, one bit long, so very, very short, then uh, this equivalence is uh, an alternate formulation of the Impagliazzo hardcore lemma, for no, those who have, have uh, heard of it. Uh, and, and its various parameters, sort of, to get this version, you need the, some of the, these dots represent parameter improvements, the optimal versions of the hardcore lemma for you equality here. Uh, and then there were later works um, with my, my student Colin Jang, and this is maybe Sporsky, Golodev, and Fischak, um, uh, showing it for, up to lo for logarithmic length random variables. And I believe this last paper even shows it provided the, the value of k. x doesn't have to be short. If x is long, then it should be that uh, the length of x minus k should be at most logarithmic. Uh, and then, oh yeah, one thing I'm hiding here, there's actually a negligible uh, loss in K in this equivalence. But I will hide that here, and then in a later <coughs> analogous result that we'll show. Are there any times suffer dramatically? You know, the, the key parameter is because all the things parameterized with the running times that you don't predict. Uh, yeah, so the running times, that's where the shortness comes in. So the running time will, the adversary, or so in the short version, the adversary has to do an enumeration over, over this you know, alphabet of x. Uh, so as this constant in the log n gets, gets worse, you're, you're paying more. Um, as far as other concrete security things, I don't remember you know, where there are other, might be other you know, bottlenecks. But the last result is the other I think the parameters, like if you specialize in the short case, it's incomparable. It improves in some ways over, over what we had uh, and is worse in some ways. Um, but it's, it's more general in that it applies not just when things are short, but when the entropy deficiency is small. Is small. All right, good. So now we're, so that's one way permutations. Uh, pseudorandom generation one-way permutations in a, in a different language. And now let's uh, lead in to uh, looking at constructing pseudorandom generators from general one-way functions and uh, see what, what goes wrong uh, when we start using the, try to use the same approach and then see how to adjust it. So it's still true when you have a general one-way function that may not be one-to-one -one, that X has, ah, okay, so how much pseudo-entropy, guessing pseudo-entropy does X have given F of X? Um, it's the log of, the, of the, the inversion probability, so super logarithmic in N if you have negligible inversion probability. And it's still true that that's true for a, for a uh, arbitrary one-way function. It doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, okay? But, this may be true that they have a lot of pseudo guessing pseudo-entropy in x given f of x for uninteresting reasons, for information theoretic reasons, not computational ones. So for example, if f of x only you know, depends on the, or f of x, I guess it can't be a one-way function if f of x is the first half of x, but f of x is some function of only the first half of x. It ignores the second, second half of x. Then there's no way, you know, you have only exponentially small probability of predicting x from f of x, but that's not because of the... Oh, actually, I did want this to not be a one-way function. So here's one where the guessing pseudo-entropy is large. It's n over 2, right? I can't predict x from f of x except with probability 2 to the minus n over 2. But that's not because of any computational hardness. Right? 
just information, theoretically, you've lost that much information. So what we would like to have is some way of capturing kind of a gap between the information theoretic hardness in X, the unpredictability of X in the information theoretic sense, and the computational hardness in X. So we really need to use the fact that, that, to that an adversary succeeds in inverting the one-way function if it finds any preimage, which we're not exploiting here. Yes, yes, that's what I mean. So we really need to exploit the fact that the one-way function guarantees that it's hard to find any preimage of x, of, of f of x. And we haven't, this notion of guessing pseudo-entropy doesn't let us get our hands on that. So what if you just change the definition of guessing, guessing the entropy to guess any? So, well, for arbitrary random variables, um, like, I, yeah, I guess what I'm looking for is a, you know, a definition of, of this play, but it's abstracted away from the, the one-way function. I mean, I guess you could say, can I guess anything that's in the support of Z given X? Um, it feels like that might be hard to work with as a, as a notion. So what we ended up settling on uh, and we came about it in a kind of circuit, got to it in a circuitous way, but uh, um, you know, actually, in retrospect, maybe it's a kind of should have been kind of natural thing at this point. Once you ask for looking for a gap, what's one you know uh, uh, information theoretic way to measure, you know, entropy theoretic way to measure gap? Uh, gaps in, in, in entropies, it's, it's talking about relative entropy. Right? And so we look at the following notion. We say, right, so before we have an adversary that's given f of x and is trying to predict x. Right? And now what our adversary is trying to do is, uh, is sample the distribution of x given f of x. Right? Like the notion of a distributional one-way function, right? An adversary breaks a distributional one-way function if, uh, given f of x, it can sample something that's statistically close to the right distribution of x given f of x. Sample an almost uniform behavior. But what we look at here, and it turns out to capture this gap between information theoretic hardness in x and the computational hardness in x, is uh, looking at the relative entropy that an adversary can achieve. Right, so this is a relative entropy or KL divergence, um, which is some Shannon theoretic measure of similarity between probability distributions, and it's measured in kind of bits of bits of entropy. And adversaries succeed. Like the goal of an adversary is to try to get <coughs> as small a uh, divergence as possible. So to sample a given f of x, sample a distribution that is. Uh, as close to the right distribution of x as possible. Make the divergence as small as possible. Um, so what can we say about a one-way function? For any one-way function, we can say that this divergence is going to be at least super logarithmic in n. All right, so that's, I mean, that's the kind of quantity we were hoping for by analogy of uh, with uh, guessing pseudoentropy is that in some sense the, the, the computational hardness in X, non-information theoretic computational hardness, right, should be like log of this inversion probability, should be super logarithmic in N. And this is at least giving us something that, 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 that's that number. What happens to the pathological example? Um, yeah, so there you can achieve entropy zero in the pathological example, right? So given f of x, so I'm given the first half of x, I can exactly sample the distribution of x given f of x. I just choose the rest of the bits uniformly at random. And so I achieve, an adversary can achieve divergence zero. So if you have like, statistical distance there, what is going to be equivalent of two and then we just choose it for optimal parameters or it's completely different? Well, so okay, good. Um, so yeah, so the notion of distributional one-way function is really just replacing this divergence with statistical distance. Um, 
And the two can be related to each other in quantitative, you know, in some way. And certainly, if one is non-zero, <coughs> I haven't worked out exactly what the relationship is. But this is going to turn out to be the one that that actually captures. In the next slide, you'll see a theorem that why this captured what we were looking for. Yes. This feels like a very weak definition in the sense that you're acquiring a lot from A. In particular, A has to be able to output with some non-zero probability each and every of the possible pre-images. Is that the correct uh, interpretation? Uh, let's see. I always get confused about which way the divergence that's goes. Um, yes, that's... The left-hand side should not have anything with positive probability when the right-hand side has with zero probability. Right. Um, so, I mean, A can, of course, do that by, you know, with some small probability, I'll put something, I'll put something uniform. But you're right that we've lost something here uh, about the, this is, this is weaker right. than the definition. So let's, let, first let's go to why one-wayness implies this. Um, but later when I talk about the open problems, about trying to improve things, that's certainly a place to look, like to try to understand what have we lost by moving here and what, what could be a substitute that, that doesn't lose what, we, what we've lost. Oh, but you also gain something, you have a weaker assumption. You can right, don't right. Any functions. Right. right, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so the proof of this is very uh, easy, in fact. So let's consider any efficient adversary A um, and consider this divergence. And now, uh, divergence, like statistical distance, like one, so it's not a metric and it doesn't have many of the properties you would want from a distance measure, it's not symmetric and, and so on. But one property it does have that shares the statistical distance is that if I apply any function to, to both random variables, the divergence can only go down. Okay. So what, what function am I going to apply? I'm going to apply the test that tests whether uh, the first component is f of the second component. Okay. And then what do I get? Well, the first f of x, x uh, will always satisfy this test. So I get a Bernoulli random variable that's always 1. And in the other case, by one wayness, the probability that a outputs a preimage of f of x is negligible. So I get a Bernoulli random variable that's 1 with the most negligible probability. And then you can just you know, calculate what's the you know, divergence of these two, which is log of this, this, this probability here, and we get super logarithmic results of entropy. Yes? So, if, yeah, the divergence is not symmetric, so is there an obvious reason why you want to do it in this order? Uh, so, um, again, the, we, we came to this by the next theorem, which You'll see, like well, this this version gives us kind of what we were looking for before. So we, we actually, you know, came to it by by kind of where starting with where we were going and figuring out what what would what would lead to that. I suspect that the other yes the chain rule. I think the I think the other way the chain rule was harder. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense because if you put f x x on the right hand side, it means that a always has to output the right preimage for this to be final. If otherwise, you're given x, right. for any given x, yeah. yeah. If you're given x, then a can take x. Right. So this is, I guess, by what what Odin was saying with the the way. Um, uh, let's see. Right. If a outputs something that's 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 not a preimage of then f, then it immediately makes the that makes the divergence infinite, but A is trying to make the divergence as small as possible. So it's not clear that it's a bad example. A, A's goal is to make the oh. divergence small. But, it, oh. but you're keep oh, oh, but, but, but A can only do that with kind of preimage with negligible probability. Yeah. Okay. okay, good, good. Yes, thank you. All right, so. I suspect that, that some kind of flipped version relates to inaccessible entropy, which we'll talk about at the end, but I have not found, a, that's just an intuition, and I haven't found a way to kind of formalize that.
that it is a dual notion that, in some sense, switch, switches the two. But I haven't figured out the, a, a formulation that quite does. All right, so let me, I'll state this theorem, and then I think it's maybe a good time to take a five minute break, since it's two hours straight is, is, is probably too much. Um, uh, so uh, it turns out that this notion, I'm calling it sampling relative entropy, again, because it's the, the minimum relative entropy that an adversary can achieve when trying to sample the right distribution of x given z, or x given f of x in our application. So it turns out that this notion is exactly equivalent to the gap between Hill pseudo-entropy and actual conditional entropy. Provided the random variable x is short. Okay. So um, that is, if this sampling relative entropy is at least k, of x given z. All right, that means any efficient algorithm, when it tries to, to get the distribution of x given z, will, the, the, it, it will not succeed its divergence from the, actual, the right distribution will be at least k. That will be the case if and only if x uh, is indistinguishable from a random variable whose entropy given z is at least k bits larger than the actual entropy of x given z. So we wanted to get our hands on, you know, if you think of these like bad examples where the function is not one to one, the gap between so some pseudo entropy and the information theoretic hardness of x given z, which here is measured by the actual Shannon entropy of x given z, and the sampling relative entropy gives us that, provided the random variable x is short. So this move to traditional information theoretic notions, it seems kind of uh, very unexpected for the work because usually they use useless for crypto things. So I don't know if you have any philosophical things. Yeah, so that's exactly, I'll talk, I'll, I'll kind of have some musings about that towards the end when we talk about um, the open problems and how to, I would love to avoid going through Shannon theoretic notions. Right. Right. And there's two reasons why, why that happens uh, for us. Um, and one of them, maybe we can say, see already, is that uh, the amount of entro actual entropy in x given f of x um, is something that is is highly variant, right? So if you if f of x has lots of preimages, then x given f of x has a lot of entropy, and when you know f of x has only one preimage or small number of preimages, has a small entropy. And so it's not looking like uh, when, we, when we think of x given f of x, a min entropy notion doesn't seem like the right, right thing because it's, it's a highly variant quantity. Whereas when we talk about min entropy and average min entropy, you generally are interested in the case where kind of uh, it's highly concentrated. The amount of unpredictability in x is highly concentrated. It's all, always you know, typically around the same value. Okay, so that's one reason the first reason, and there'll be another reason why we also um, kind of benefit from moving to, to Shannon notions, but I would love to avoid that. Yeah. So are this, <coughs> sorry, so you said that the length of x is logarithmic, so if you let it vary, so where do you lose? So if you... The, the, there's a reduction between these two. Right. Uh, and the, the, the cost of the reduction is exponential, is, is the alphabet size of x. Um, so this is very similar. You should think of this as an analog to the, the generalization of the Impagliazzo hardcore theorem that I said before. So in that, we also had x being short, z can be long. And here we had guessing pseudo-entropy is equivalent to pseudo-min entropy, um, indistinguishability from having high, high min entropy. Okay? And the sh Shannon theoretic analog of that is here we have Shannon conditional pseudo-entropy. And what we, we get on top is, uh, is this uh, sampling relative entropy. So instead of guessing x from z, it's sampling the distribution and measuring the, the quality by, by divergence. Right? And the other change that we got this, what we have here is, 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 in, is a difference between the <coughs> as opposed to just the entropy itself.
All right, so why don't we pause here, take a, take a five minute break or so, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about how we make use of this. All right, so the reason we can't just use it right away is that our x is not short. An n bit input to the one way function. Conditional entropies of those random variables, you'll still get, you won't lose anything. They'll, they'll sum to what you had originally. Um, and so uh, you'll be able to apply that and get the pseudo entropy of pieces of x given f of x and previous pieces of x. All right, we'll see what that, uh, how that works in a moment. The second issue that we have is that this is Shannon and entropy. All right, so Shannon entropy was good for us there, but where it's bad for us is that you can't extract from Shannon entropy. Uh, you need some more worst case, you know, high probability analog, like min entropy or being close to having min, having min entropy. And so what we will do for that is uh, take many samples, uh, independent samples, and then, as we'll talk about, Shannon entropy kind of converges in to something that's close to, to min entropy, um, and then we'll be able to do extraction. And that's where a lot, of the, a lot of, most of the cost in the constructions will come from, is this conversion of Shannon entropy to min entropy. Okay, so let's first understand what happens when we break our x into small pieces. It turns out what you get is, so we have f of x, and now let's break x into bits. We can break them into logarithmic length pieces, but bits will be notationally easier. But f of x and then x1 up to xn. Um, and what we can say is that this sequence has what we call next bit pseudo entropy. Bigger than, so its actual entropy is n, because n, you take n bits to choose a uniformly random x, and then f of x is determined from it. But its next bit pseudo entropy will be larger than n by exactly this super logarithmic and n quantity. Um, and again, you know, recalling its actual pseudo entropy is is uh, is only maybe, you know negligibly more than n. But this what this next bit notion will give us is something uh, significantly larger than n. 
in All right, so what is the notion of next bit pseudoentropy? It's a generalization it's of, of our notion of, of conditional pseudoentropy um, to a sequence, but where we imagine an adversary that kind of sees one bit at a time. All right, so we imagine an adversary that sees f of x, and now to that adversary, x1 is indistinguishable from having some, some entropy. All right, x1 has some pseudoentropy given f of x. And then we can consider an adversary that sees f of x and x1, and to that adversary, x2 looks like it has some amount of entropy. And similarly, and so on and so forth. The adversary sees f, f of x, x1, x2, x3 looks like it has some entropy. All right, so there's a sequence of random variables y1 to yn, so that uh, an adversary to given like f of x together with x1, the first i bits of x, is indistinguishable from f of x together with the first i minus 1 bits of x together with yi. So y, xi is indistinguishable from yi given everything that came before. Not necessarily given, given what comes in the future. And secondly, if we sum up the, the entropy, sorry, so we say, take the entropy of f of x, which is our first block here, and then the entropy of yi given the prefixes, the sum of these is going to be more than n, n plus super logarithmic. Okay, so this is a, I mean, it's again a weaker notion than ordinary pseudo, pseudo entropy. Um, one intuition for why this might suffice for us when we, in the end, want to construct a pseudo random generator is that we know that pseudo randomness is equivalent to next bit pseudo randomness. Right? That's what the, you know, Yao's equivalence between pseudo randomness and next bit unpredictability is. So this you can think of as a kind of quantitative analog of kind of next bit pseudorandomness. All right, so let me just explain how this fact, this next bit pseudoentropy of this sequence, follows from uh, this theorem, this equivalence between sampling relative entropy and pseudoentropy of x given Z, along with the lemma that we had before about the sampling relative entropy of x given f of x. All right, so we have a one-way function um, that a uh, claim which we proved before says that given f of x, x has sampling relative entropy super, super logarithmic in n. Um, so now by, uh, all right, so this, is, this requires proof, but this is kind of like a chain rule for sampling relative entropy. So if we break x into bits, what we want to say is, uh, on average, the, the bits of x, given the prefix, f of x and the previous bits, have sampling relative entropy um, uh, super logarithmic n divided by n. Because I'm, I'm, so here, j is uniformly random from 1 to n. So I'm averaging over the n bits. How much sampling relative entropy do they have? OK, so this one, maybe it's worth saying a few words about the, the, uh, the proof. Like what, you, you prove this by a reduction. So suppose I have an adversary that, for a random index j, can sample the right distribution of the next bit given the prefix, all right, up to some small divergence. How do I build an adversary that can sample all of x given f of x? Um, well, you just use the other, ad the previous adversary, n times. I'm given f of x. I use the adversary that breaks this to first try to sample the first bit of x. Then I use that same adversary on what it has produced to sample the next bit of x. And then I use the same attitude to sample the next bit of x and so on. And it turns out that uh, by chain rules for divergence, this resulting adversary um, achieves divergence that's just the sum of the divergences of the next bit adversary over the n bits. And so on average, the sum of those divergences has to be I mean, the sum of those divergences has to be at most 
super logarithmic in n, so on average, the divergence achieved per bit is at least super logarithmic in n divided by n. Um, so it's interesting, this is, a, this is an example of a, a very adaptive uh, use of the adversary in this, in this reduction. Um, uh, all right, and then uh, we've now, now that we've broken things into bits, and we're talking about next bit sampling entropy, we can apply the theorem which says next bit sampling entropy, relative entropy, is equivalent to gap between pseudo entropy and actual Shannon entropy, conditional Shannon entropy. All right, so, Given the prefix, on average, the, the next bits have pseudo-entropy that's larger than the actual entropy by super logarithmic n divided by 10. And now we do another chain rule to, to go back to looking, well, not a chain rule. This is now just a definition, actually. Now, if you think about what the definition of next bit pseudo-entropy says, um, it, it's basically saying that each bit um, the sum of the pseudo-entropies gaps in, in the bits. Uh, so this is telling us that the sum of the pseudo-entropy gaps is super logarithmic in n. And so, the, uh, uh, but now if I sum the actual entropies over the next bits, they're gonna sum up to n, the actual conditional entropy of x1 given, uh, of f of x, uh, x1 given f of x, x2 given f of x, and x1, and so on. And so I get exactly what I like before. All right, so this is just a reformulation, I and mean more or less a reformulation of next bit pseudo entropy. So you, maybe you mentioned this before, but in HRV10, this same thing was lost a factor of 10, right? Lost it? Like, as in you were able to show n plus n equal to n, right? Like, I mean. Like no, no, no. HRV also got a similar bound. But not for such a simple, so instead of f of x and x, there was also some hashing on x. We had to apply, we used the goldback leaven theorem to build a distribution that was like this. But, we, but, the, but there was no extra factor of n. <coughs> the savings between the two comes, comes later. Can the second, yeah. look, how, how do you get the last step? Just, just the last step. The last one is staring just at the definition of next bit pseudo-entropy. Where does the end come from? Ah, summing the actual entropies. So in next bit pseudo entropy, what I'm summing is the entropy of f of x and the actual entropy um, of, well. So the f is not the one way function, right? So, uh, one to one, one function, so. No, no, no. So that, that's why here in next bit pseudo entropy, I have the term which is the actual entropy of f of x. I'm including it in there. So it might be much more than n, right? Uh, but it's at, it's at least n, that's what I care about. When you look at the, the actual entropy, it's exactly n, choosing x, f of x. Might be less, right? F of x could delete a few bits. No. Look, so it's f of x and x together. No, that, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm looking but the first one is just f of x. Yeah. So, so what am I interested in? I'm interested in, let's, let's take this n and move it to the other side, subtract it. So that is equal to the entropy of f of x plus the sum of the conditional entropies of the xi's given the prefixes. I guess the question is, assume f has a range of only n over 2 bits. And it seems like you're asking for much more from the... <coughs> no, so this thing here is n. Okay? So now subtract this quantity from both sides. On the left, the n will go away. <coughs> and on the top, the h of f of x's will get canceled. Okay? And then what I get is the sum of the entropy gaps, the difference in, in, in conditional entropy of yi and xi which is exactly what uh, the second to last thing is telling us about. And that thing sums to omega log.
Oh, no, no. Uh, not really, no. I mean, that just is some... That's hidden in all the tildes that I was giving in the period. Like, for concrete security, you, you care, care about it, but uh, not in this poly polynomial regime and if we don't care about polylog factors. So, if suppose that the person has another technique that instead of going bit by bit, can block the thing with something smaller uh, than n bits, or n over the n bits. Ah, okay, so one thing we know is that we can do it um, up to log of the security. So like when you talk about like an exponentially secure one-way function, we can actually break in linear and in length slots because this <coughs> length of these blocks, exponential in length of these blocks is a, is a cost we pay in the reduction. Um, so, uh, well, so I mean, actually that, that's different from this entropy gap here. Um, so maybe I didn't follow your question. Okay, all right, great. To your point, if it's an exponentially hard, that would be like constant times n. The gap would be, you could get a gap of. Uh, yeah, this would be yeah. like, you know, 1.01 .01 times n. That's right. <coughs> okay, so now that we have next bit pseudo entropy. So, all right, so we said we had two problems. One we solved. One was that uh, our theorem only applied for short <coughs> blocks, but we, we solved that by breaking things the blocks. We got next bit pseudo entropy. The second problem was that this is Shannon entropy, and we can't extract pseudo randomness from, from Shannon pseudo entropy. So, the idea was to do repetitions. All right, so we have. Um, uh, uh, we'll take many independent, roughly a quadratic number of independent inputs to the one-way function f, um, and look at this in kind of next-bit pseudo-entropy generator um, uh, for each of those inputs, and then uh, look at try to do extraction <coughs> blockwise. So the first block here is f of x1, f of x2, and so on. Then these are the first bit, all right, so now here the subscripts are, are different inputs. So not, not the bits of x. So this is the first bit of x1, the first bit of x2, and the first bit of xt, and so on. Um, so why does this work? So I mentioned before that if you take um, many independent samples of a random variable, then Shannon entropy is going to get converted to min entropy. And for those who haven't seen it, the reason that this happens So say I have uh, some random variable w, 
And now I take t independent copies, IID copies of that random variable w. And I look at a particular possible sequence that it could be this, this tuple to produce, little w1 up to little wt. Um, if I look at the probabilities, my independence as the product of the individual probabilities, which, when I take logarithms to look at entropies, turns into a sum. Uh, now, one term of this sum, the expectation of this is, uh, is just the entropy of, let's say they're all, again, independent copies of some random variable w, it's the Shannon entropy. This is exactly the def that's the definition of Shannon entropy. It's the expectation of this. And the other thing that's important when we so you know you check by central limit theorem um, or law of large numbers that uh, when you take many independent samples, this is going to converge. I mean, this is going to be approximately t times the expectation. But how quickly that happens also depends on the, you know, the range of these random variables. And what kind of range do we expect if each of these w's are taking values as n-bit strings? Um, the range we expect for these is typically between 0 and something that's order n. Okay, it is possible. Actually, for a one-way function, it's going to be definitely between 0 and n, because you generate it using n bits, input bits from the one-way function. Right? If I've generated this using at most n random bits, then the smallest this probability can be is 2 to the minus n. Okay? So this is just to tell you what, sort of quantitatively, why are we doing n squared repetitions? So when you apply something like, now you can apply the Chernoff bound. You have bounded random variables, and you know their expectation. And what you expect is that you will get the expectation, so the expect expectation of the pseudo-entropy. So this is the entropies of the yi's we're looking at here, the things that you're indistinguishable from. The expectation of that, summed up over everything, is going to be t times n plus log n. So that's how much entropy there is total in the y's together with f of x. Um, but you lose um, by, uh, when you turn off by square root of t, the number of repetitions, times the, the range, which here is 0 to n. Okay, and so what we want is that this loss is smaller than what we, the gap between pseudo-entropy and actual entropy. Um, and that will happen when t is bigger than about n squared. <coughs> Right? And so when t is bigger than n squared, this whole thing will still be bigger than t times n. And t times n is, is the amount of randomness we invested to, to generate all of this. Because we chose t independent inputs to the one way function. Okay? So we can extract this many, uh, so we get, all right, so I didn't say, why is this giving us so what you get by, by Chernoff bound is that with high probability, this log of ratio of probabilities is going to be um, close to the expectation, which is equivalent to saying that you're, uh, you're close to a random variable whose min entropy is that value, at least that value. And then we can do random extraction, all right? So min, because this is kind of like with high probability having some amount of min entropy. Instead of, instead of worst case minimum, you're taking, you're saying high probability, and that's good enough for, for extraction. <coughs> All right, so, so this works, this is great, uh, except uh, we don't know how much randomness to extract from each column. We know the sum of these entropies, um, we know what their sum is, but we don't know how it's spread out among the different components yi. Why not just extract from the whole thing? Why do column by column? Ah, why do column by column? Good. So this is where, uh, because we only have next bit indistinguishability. All right, so next bit indistinguishability. Good, so we need to prove this is pseudo-random. The way we're going to do it 
is by a hybrid argument, which will require showing that each column is pseudo-random given the previous ones. Okay? And that we can do because yi has, is indistinguishable from xi given the previous ones. But if I, as soon as, if I have the other ones, if I try to work with them all together, like y1 may lose all of its pseudo-entropy once I, once I look at the future. Can you explain again what the columns represent? For instance, do you take the first bit of f? Because that might always be zero, or do we know? Uh, you could, um, but here, the, this one could, might as well be just, uh, the first could actually be a block, not a bit. So it could be f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, f of xt. Because here, there's no pseudo entropy we're trying to get. We're just trying to get the actual entropy in the, in the outputs of f. And then in the, in the x's, then this will be the first bit of x1, first bit of x2, first bit of x2, second bit of x1, second bit of x2, and so on. So you do need the s. What? You do need the s. You do you need the s. ignore the first Yeah, bit. otherwise, as you said, we will lose some of the entropy that, that we, right. I mean, there is entropy in the output of that. If you think of a one-way permutation, it's extremely the case. Other questions? Okay, so we need to solve this problem. How, how do, or so you can get a non-uniform construction here. That if someone tells you these, these numbers, it's a lot of advice, but they tell you these, how much entropy, actually these values here, what are these conditional entropies, uh, then, then you can implement this. Okay, and so, uh, what we'll see is a technique called entropy equalization, um, which will cost us, a, so here we had only n squared evaluations and our seed length is, will be n cubed because it's n squared inputs to, to f we, we need to choose. Um, this entropy equalization will solve this difficulty of not knowing the, the, how the entropy is distributed and it'll cost us another factor of roughly n uh, in the number of queries and the seed length. And then we'll see how we can actually save the factor of n in the seed length from this uh, uh, using additivity. So Let me see. Yeah. Ah. Yes. yes. So if you didn't care about the complexity, uh -huh. you could actually track from which point on. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, we, we still, we wanted to get, we want to make sure that we get more bits out than we put in. And so if we, it's not just for complexity saving. So if we put in, if we don't, if we don't really extract close to the full amount that's guaranteed <coughs> here, uh, we won't get any stretch in our, in our generator. Oh yes, 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 yes. You can do this trick <coughs> that, um, that's done in, in Hill. And actually, this is the thing that, like, if you want the best construction for exponentially hard one-way functions, actually, we I think we do do what you described there. Um, uh, that's right. Uh, no, here it's too many things to guess. But for exponentially hard one-way functions, it's not too many things to guess. So uh, what Hugo is suggesting is let's just, suppose there were not many blocks. All right, suppose there's only a constant number of blocks, 10 blocks. You know, there's uh, only then a polynomial intuitively, like each of these entropy thresholds, maybe you need to guess to some precision one over poly n. Uh, and so you, uh, there's only polynomially many a space of polynomially many different guesses that you could try enumerating over all of them. And then this trick that, that goes back to, to Hill is that you, you build a generator for all of them. You apply, uh, only one is right, so only one of them is actually a pseudorandom generator. Uh, and then you apply massive length expansion to all the generators. And then you can XOR the generators together uh, and You've made your seed length a lot bigger because you have to choose seeds for all of these choices, but because you did uh, length expansion, your one good generator will, will save you. Yes? What, 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 
why do these work for years if you have in the uh, Ah, because they don't break things into pieces. They are basically guessing just the entropy of x given f of x. Actually, I think maybe they were even just guessing things around this, this, that and maybe the security. Yeah. So if we are choosing just for non-uniform we're Then we're done, yes. That's right. So that's also a good guidance if you, if you want to work on lower bounds here. Keep in mind that like, if you want to you know, prove that this cost is necessary, Actually, we already know this one. This cost is necessary, but it, it, it can't be for a non-uniform construction that depends on the function. All right, so what is this entropy equalization trick? It's very, very simple. Um, so before we did kind of vertical repetitions. Uh, now we'll do some horizontal repetitions with a random shift. Okay, I'll take each row here will be n copies, independent copies of that same next bit pseudo entropy generator. So I have an f of x, x here, and then another f of x, you know, f of x prime followed by x prime, f of x double prime followed by x double prime, and so on in each row. I do that, but I also will randomly shift each of the blocks. So you don't even need to, it was pointed out in Barcelona, Leo pointed out to me that you don't, you don't need to do a random shift, you can just also um, shift the second one over one block, the third one over two blocks, the fourth one over three blocks, and so on. Okay. What is the point? The point is that what I want in, in most of the columns now to have an equal contribution from each of the blocks. All right, so, in uh, some columns, uh, in one column, like uh, in some rows, f of x will be what appears in that column. In some other rows, the first bit of x will be what appears in that column. In other rows, x2 will be what appears in that column, and so on. Okay? And I want each of these n plus 1 components to appear uh, an equal number of times, or an expectation an equal number of times in each uh, column. And that way, the entropy that I'm getting in each column will, will, uh, will correspond to this known value, the sum. Not, uh, not just you know, one particular of these entropies. Okay. All right, so to do this, so you can do this either by random shifting or just deterministically like, you know, uh, shifting, you know, uh, over by one, over by two, over by three. But the problem is that on the two sides, uh, we don't have, you know, the, uh, not all the rows uh, appear in every column. There, there'll be these blank portions where we don't have all the rows appearing. And so we, have, we discard what happens on the left and the right, and that's why we need to do n repetition so that the, the win we get in pseudo-entropy from what we keep is larger than the entropy we lose by what we discard, which is we roughly are discarding n bits uh, from, from each row. And so if we do n copies and n times log n is bigger than this n that we've lost. Yes. Sorry, why are we discarding bits instead of wrapping them around? Next bit pseudo-entropy becomes problematic for the wrapping around. Again, this hybrid argument. Maybe there's a way of making it work. Um, I'm not, I don't know how to analyze it. Okay, good. So that is the complete um, kind of HRV construction. Uh, uh, that, uh, and then to get this, uh, or to get the parameters of HRV. And then uh, uh, savings um, you can do, and maybe I won't go in detail, is we, we, it turns out you can recycle randomness in this construction. So uh, it turns out you can use bits that we extract here. So we don't, we don't build the whole table at once. We start from the right. We take like two copies of the next bit pseudo entropy generator on the, on the right side, each ran, randomly shifted. That's enough for us to start extracting as soon as we have a two. We've discarded, so we've looked lost some entropy, but we can start already producing some of our pseudo-random bits. 
And once we have some of these, we can use this randomness to start constructing. So we have some that's a win, like that's a gain over the actual entropy. Those we output. And other ones we use to start filling in more values here. To choose more inputs to the one-way function to continue filling out this, this, uh, <coughs> this picture. Okay. Yes? So I think I'm missing still something sort of basic. So if, if you're saying if you have a lot of columns where in each column the sum of the pseudo the next bit pseudoentropies are high, I can sort of extract from each column I get pseudoentropy. But why can't a future column kill the entropy of a previous column? Because the way, so it's this equivalence of next bit pseudorandomness and pseudorandomness. I see. It proved the pseudorandomness of the, of the final thing right. by a hybrid argument, which only requires you to prove that the thing you've extracted from each column is indistinguishable from uniform given what came before. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, see. It's magical, but y'all proved it, so. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I don't think I don't think it's worth spending more time. There's some recycling you can do that gives you an adaptive construction like this that saves you a fact, saves you this cost in the seed land. Um, so I do want to remark. So now we're kind of starting to talk about kind of open problems and lower bounds. This problem of not knowing how much to extract, how much entropy is in one place versus another, already comes up in the case of regular one-way functions. Um, when you have unknown regularity. All right, suppose I have a regular one-way function, so every output is the same number of pre-images. Um, you know, if you look at the entropy of f of x, and in fact, it's given the min entropy, and the entropy of x given f of x, these two sum to n. But we don't know, uh, for if you have unknown regularity, how it's split between these two terms. And there's a, um, a beautiful older solution to this. I lost my animation. It really matters. Um, of uh, Goldreich, Hugo, and uh, uh, Luby, uh, which was then recently improved quantitatively by Hickner, Heinrich, and Reinbold, uh, called the randomized iterate uh, for, for dealing with this. Uh, and it is uh, also an adaptive construction, like the one I just sketched, where we recycle randomness and this entropy equalization. Um, it does cost you a factor of n in your queries to the one-way function. So just like the thing which I said before, multiply your number of queries by a factor of order n. Um, and it has the cost in the seed length originally was also something like n or a polynomial in n. Uh, but what HHR showed is that you can actually save that cost. You can uh, de-randomize this uh, construction and bring it down to order log n. And maybe it's even conjectured that this can be an order, order one factor in the, in the seed length. So kind of very similar to uh, what we're talking about. And this is the one lower bound we know for constructing pseudorandom generators from one-way functions, uh, where you don't care about the stretch, where you just want to stretch by one bit. Holmstein and Shin Sinha showed that this, that you need at least n queries to the one-way function to making a black box construction of pseudorandom generators from unknown regular one-way functions. Okay, I should mention there are also Gennaro Trevisan um, have uh, this uh, lower bounds on the number of invocations of the one-way function you need uh, no, roughly needs to grow linearly with the stretch of the pseudorandom generator, generator, generator you want. But here, we're, uh, if you're just talking about getting your you know, first bit of stretch, this is the only lower bound we need. No. When you know the regularity, uh, there's a much more efficient construction. You only need one query to the one-way function. Um, you can just do randomness extraction on f of x and, and uh, Goldrick Levin on x. And what's the best bound for one-way function? Is, is, is your paper, the one you presented today, is that the best bound in number of queries? Yes. And what is it? N cubed. N cubed. So, so we still have a gap in terms of, uh, for general one-way functions. 
yes. between a lot of them. And, and, and what's your guess? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Open problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. So we have we've seen this uh, construction or sketch of, of the construction. Number of queries is about n cubed, coming for two reasons. We get n squared repetitions we did vertically for converting Shannon entropy to min entropy. And n repetitions we did horizontally because of unknown entropy thresholds. And I interpret the Hohenstein Sinev result as telling us this order n is necessary in a black box construction. All right, so the question is what about this one? All right, and then our seed length, if you make non-adaptive queries, we basically pay to make each query independently, so the number of queries times n, so that's what gives us the n to the fourth seed length. And if you're willing to make adaptive queries, then you can save the, that it's only the Shannon entropy to min entropy that we currently, we pay that, but this one we, we know, we saw sketched how to save. So you get n cubed, n squared times n. Um, all right. Uh, all right, so open problems, all right, so we know nothing ruling out a construction that gives you order n seed length and a number of queries to the one-way function that's order n. And that's why you're saying you want to get rid of Shannon entropy if you can. Yes. Because right, that's so that's where you're paying all your... Right. That's right. So... Uh, yeah, and I, I don't know what to believe here. Um, whether, whether there's a better construction or whether, you know, maybe I'm slightly more on the lower bound side, but I, I, I really would hesitate. The that we know is about regular functions of unknown regularity. So yes. If it's that low, it means that the general unknown function is not as good as that. Right. Yes. And uh, though, yes, yes, exactly. Right. And is there any relationship between the seed length and the number of queries? So, so right, all right. So why are we why are we paying this biggest cost is coming from conversion of Shannon entropy to min entropy. Um, the biggest cost in both. So it costs us n squared in our number of queries, and uh, we only know how to do that with really independent samples, and that gives us queries times n. Um, so let's talk about this, this, this part. All right, so there's two, two questions that you might ask. One is what I think Evgeny was asking earlier. Why are we talking about Shannon entropy at all? Why did we switch, move to Shannon entropy? Uh, I see two reasons. One is when we have a general one-way function, the amount of randomness is sometimes there's more, like, uh, it varies how much of the randomness is coming from f of x versus x. Okay, sometimes f of x determines x. Other times, f of x there's a lot of pre-images of the of the output. Um, and in one case, uh, f of x has a lot of entropy, and in the other case, x has a lot of entropy given f of x. Like in that particular sample. And you know, how do we deal with this this? you know, this varying pseudo-entropy, it's hard to get our hands on a good kind of min-entropy notion to, to capture that. And so that's one place where it was convenient to switch to Shannon entropy. Because it just says, on average, these two things are still going to sum up to n. But maybe you can kind of reason about both together. And then the second place, um, though this one I think is less, less fundamental, and actually if you go back to the original HRV construction, as opposed to the, the more recent one, comes from you know when we break things into blocks and apply chain rule. Uh, uh, there too, you know, in general, you're not guaranteed about how the entropy is going to be distributed among those those bits of x. And that the chain rule, you know, the Shannon entropy. Thing. So maybe there's a way of avoiding going to Shannon entropy. A second possibility is that there's no way of avoiding to go to Shannon entropy, and so we need somehow to convert from Shannon entropy to min entropy, something we can extract from the pseudo min entropy. Uh, so the other question is, do, if, if you need to do that, do you need to pay this cost of n squared? Um, and I don't know. And here's a completely information theoretic 
version of that question that I thought should be easy to answer, but um, you know, I've been thinking about it on and off for years and still have no idea. Um, so, all right, so here's a positive result, a kind of information theoretic analog of converting Shannon entropy to min entropy. So I have an Oracle algorithm, okay? And what's gonna be given Oracle access to is a function from n bits to n bits, which I think of as describing an output distribution. Kind of, I take x on, uh, on random bits and look at its output distribution, and, and I can ask, what's the Shannon entropy of that? Okay, and let's say either it's at least n over 2 plus 1, or at most n over 2 are the two cases. And I have this Oracle algorithm that's given Oracle access to such a function. The al algorithm can toss its coins, coins of its own, and then make queries, possibly adaptive queries, to this x. But even non-adaptively, I don't know how to, how to kind of show what we want. And its output should be, in one case, either should have high min entropy or even stronger, gives you something close to uniform. And in the other case should have low, what's called max entropy. Okay, so uh, even should have small support. So you can think of the first case here as an analogous to pseudo-randomness, close to uniform, but this is statistically close. And this is analogous to having short C. The support of the distribution is, is negligible fraction of the space. In the work on complete problems for statistical zero knowledge, or non-interactive statistical zero knowledge, such a reduction uh, was, was given in this paper with um, uh, okay, Goldreich and Emmett Tsai. And the number of queries that, that the algorithm makes this transformation is order n squared, which is coming from converting Shannon entropy to min entropy. Exactly for this, this, this you know, thing we did here, turn off that. But I don't know how to prove a super linear lower bound on, on Q um, or on, on S. So there, the, the amount of randomness used by A is basically N times Q, because it, it picks Q independent inputs to, to. Uh, yes. Just, uh, I mean, as a candidate construction, if you use pairwise independence as opposed to fully independent strings, can you prove or disprove further? Yeah, what can you say about, like if these were pairwise? There, I suspect you can come up with a counterexample about uh, you aren't gonna, there isn't even enough randomness to get t times the entropy if these are pairwise independent samples. But it doesn't violate the, the common sample. As you let's say it worked, then would it? No, only lower bounds only on number of queries. <coughs> so even, right. yeah, so, right. okay. yeah. So, so also in the Holmstein case, for a, for a non-adaptive construction, one might be able to prove that you need to do the queries independently and do q times that. So, so, just, so what are you trying to do? You're trying to kind of distinguish the cases of Shannon entropy and over two plus one and over two, kind of splitting them. Yeah, by. think of this as high, this is like, think of this as your Y's, your high Shannon entropy or your Y's. And these are your X's, which are kind of corresponding to your, you know, they're generated using few random bits. Okay. And you need to amplify this gap, but more importantly, make it something that you can extract, get close to uniform, from in, in this case, while, yeah. And, and this is enough, the second case is enough, what is that? This is negligible times 2 to the m. This is an output within a range of size 2 to the m, the negligible fraction of the range. This to me is just a toy, I don't know how to formally, I haven't tried to formally say, if you have a lower bound here, can we translate it to a black box lower bound of sort of random generators from one-way function? But it feels like this is the question that we need to answer if, if once you're in Shannon entropy, um, do you need to pay a cost? So is this sufficient? I said I don't. I, I don't know. We, we, we improving the lower bound here, or an improvement here. It. I don't know either of those formally translates to anything on the pseudorandom generator side. But uh, I mean, you said it's converting Shannon to min entropy. I'm just trying to look from a technical statement. Like the second condition, I guess, is a min entropy condition. Uh, this is like min entropy, and this is like max entropy. Like you're, you're turning um, right. into the worst case analogs. All right, so I think I won't 
say uh, much about inaccessible entropy. I knew time more important to go through something carefully. I just want to say uh, there is this dual notion of uh, inaccessible entropy, which is a computational way of getting your hands on upper bounds on entropy, saying that to efficient algorithms, there's a sense in which a random variable uh, has less entropy uh, than its actual entropy. Um, and this seems related to things like collision resistance and uh, computational binding properties of commitments. And there, there is also a very similar looking, I mean, there's many parallels between the way, so we used in next bit, we used accessible, inaccessible entropy for constructing statistically high commitments and also universal one-way hash functions from one-way functions. And the first step is very much like what we did with pseudo-random generators from one-way functions, except that we break f of x into bits instead of x. And we get a gap of log, super logarithmic in n again, but it's in the other direction. The actual entropy is n. It's accessible entropy is the most n minus omega log n. So there, there seems to be a lot of parallel there. And also how we use it is very similar. Entropy equalization was first uh, discovered in this context. We do repetitions to convert Shannon entropy to min entropy. And then we do some hashing, in this case interactive hashing, which uh, is, is the analog of the extraction step in the pseudo in this case. Okay. So, uh, so in terms of uh, questions, you know, related to what Chris asked, my answer to Chris's question before, uh, it feels like this strong parallel between inaccess duality between inaccessible entropy and pseudo entropy. I would love to be able to make that more formal, um, but I don't know how to other than just saying, well, we you know translate ideas from, from one to the other. And there are analogous open problems to the ones that we discussed about so the random generator constructions for constructing, for example, statistically hiding commitments from multiple functions. Right? So instead of seed length, communication complexity, um, what might be the analogous quantity to look, like, to look at for uh, statistically hiding commitments. And I think that's a good time to stop. But let's take one or two more. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, thanks, Alil, again, and we'll be back here at noon.